Today on In Grace, a brand new amazing discovery, the oldest Hebrew in Israel. Are you looking for hope? My amazing parents taught me to look for hope in the Lord, and that gave me a passion to explore God's incredible creation. I'm Jim Scudder, Jr. Let's go on an adventure together and find hope in grace. Welcome to In Grace, I'm Jim Scudder, Jr. And we're in Judea, Samaria. We are in what is called the West Bank of Israel, about 19 miles north of Jerusalem. Why are we here? Well, we are going to follow up with the dig in Shiloh. Now Shiloh, of course, we've been to before on In Grace. You can watch Joshua's Conquest, and that would be part four. Or Digging the Bible is another episode that you can watch and learn more about the dig happening here. We're gonna get an update from our friend, Dr. Scott Stripling, who is the director of the largest dig in Israel, which is at Shiloh. One of the reasons we're here is to also get an update on one of the discoveries that Scott and his team made from Mount Ebal, which is just north of here, another maybe uh, 40 minutes or so, on Mount Ebal, which is the mountain of cursing in Joshua's cursing and blessing episode after he took the land. A few months ago, I was contacted by the Associates for Biblical Research, and they invited In Grace to a press conference in Houston on this incredible discovery, perhaps the greatest archaeological discovery that connects the Bible and the land to the truth of Scripture, and it gives us a lot of clues and insights into early alphabets and Hebrew. So this little find is really shaking the world. We're gonna do a lot today, so enjoy today's In Grace. So Scott, lots of stuff happening in archeology, span especially with what you're involved in. The big news though, is the curse tablet. So walk us through how that you came to be the one in your group to find that and give us that story. Well, it's uh, interesting. It started in 2019, the last day of the dig, which so it's almost exactly three years ago. And a group of scholars came to visit me the last day of the dig. And we were sitting around discussing various archeological matters. And the topic came up of Mount Ival, and we were lamenting that we were not able to do additional archaeological work right now because it's in a sensitive area. And I threw out the idea that, well, we, we could wet sift the dump piles because we were right next to our wet sifting station, and that's not an archaeological project because it's something that already happened. We wouldn't be doing additional work, and everybody's eyes lit up, and everybody loved that idea. But uh, we talked about the challenges that would go with it in June of 2019, In Grace went with Scott and his team to see Mount Ebal and film part three of Joshua's Conquest. We hired a bulletproof bus and had a military escort lead us up to this Mount of Cursing. I remember being so amazed standing there where Joshua stood just as Israel was reaffirming her covenant with God. I also remember Dr. Stripling mentioned that he would love to wet sift the discard pile of Israeli archaeologist Adam Zertal. Little did I realize that a tiny little lead tablet was lying below my feet that would shake the archaeological community and the world. To make a long story short, we were able to raise the money and bring a team in December of 2019 and we wet sifted about 30% of Adam Zivitao's dump piles from the 1980s. And there was a discovery, the one that actually first saw it in the wash section was a woman that would be the best person to find it. Yeah, Frankie Snyder is our small finds expert and um, it, providentially the uh, tablet was in her tray. So Frankie Snyder, I hear that you were the one that found the curse tablet in your washing station tray. Yes, I was. It was quite exciting. Um, when we went up to uh, Harival, or Mount Ebal, 
we sort of had the back of our mind, wouldn't it be neat to find a cursed tablet on the mountain of curses? Hmm. Of course, that was like, you know, <laughs> sure, right. You're really going to find that. Um, but as we were sifting the material, I saw on my tray what looked like a piece of clay. Looks like a, a pottery shard, you know, just a little broken piece like that. But when I picked it up, I realized how heavy it was. It was like, whoa, that's heavy. That must be lead. I've dealt with lead before mm. in sifting. And you realize it's about, oh, 10 times as heavy as pottery, you know, for a piece. So I picked it up and I looked at it. And what I could, I washed it off more. What I could see on the side of it was like two pieces that were folded over together. And you could see a seam down the middle. And I could see it going three quarters of the way around it. So I knew at this point that it was a tablet. Mm. Now, was this, did it didn't have anything written on it. We weren't going to find out for a while. Um, but I knew that lead tablets very often are cursed tablets. It's a, it's a legal document saying that this person or this group of people is accepting a covenant where you will be blessed if you do one thing, you will be cursed if you do something else. And they are acknowledging that they could be cursed because they, they did something that was against the covenant. When Frankie saw it, she recognized it immediately. She called me over, uh, showed it to me, and <laughs> my heart just sort of leaped out of my chest because I saw it was a cursed tablet, a folded lead tablet. We call these de fixio. And we've, we, we know hundreds of them here in Israel, but they're usually from later time periods. And so my first thought was, this is um, probably from a later time period. Some person who knew this was Joshua's altar had come back and commemoratively left this tablet. I remember just telling him, you know, this is really amazing, a cursed tablet from the mountain of the curse, from Joshua's altar, but you know, we, let's not assume that there's text on it. And so we were very cautious and uh, then we were locked out of the country. So we couldn't get in to follow up because of the pandemic to do the testing that we wanted to do on it. But finally, a year ago, I was able to, to come and get the tablet to Prague and there we were able to scan it and recover text from the inside. Why pick Prague? Is that because they were the ones that have pioneered this type of technology? They had a track record. They had scanned lead objects before. Uh, not as thick as this, but they had published lead objects that they had scanned and recovered text. That gave me confidence that that would be a good partnership. It's a series of scans, and the scans would each go a little bit deeper and deeper, micro, obviously, but eventually then that all lays out in a computer program to show you what's inside. That's right. You, you have slices is what they call mm -hmm. them. So each one is numbered, and so there's countless slices that are done. And then the post-processing, the data processing that's done afterwards is extensive to, to get the slices in such a way that we can see that particular slice. When we got into the sweet spot, it was clear because the letters began to pop. We're working on three continents and so different time zones. And so I would wake up in the morning and then there would be a, uh, there's a letter. Well, the first one was an Aleph, but not any Aleph. It was a proto-alphabetic Aleph. Early uh, Extremely writing. Extremely early. Right. And I th it's like an ox head that's morphing into the Hebrew Aleph, the first word of the Hebrew alphabet. And of course, I already, in my mind, I thought, well, it would be ideal if you had the word Arur, curse, on there. So now we've got the first letter of it. And I thought, wow, if the next letter is a Resh, this will be really interesting. And it was. And so the, here we have the word curse. And it was just unbelievable. And then we had it again. And ultimately, we had 48 letters that we were able to recover from the inside of the tablet, most with a pretty high degree of certainty, a few that are not as clear, but we'll put those in brackets in the publication. But the, I think the reading stands, and it includes the oldest mention of the name of the Hebrew God. So you have yod heh vav and so in the Hebrew Bible, you have the two-letter spelling, a three-letter spelling, and a four-letter spelling. So here we had a curse, including the name of God, from a, a, a biblical site that purports to have Joshua there writing and proclaiming curses. So it was just a, an incredible synchronism. So the significance of this. Now, obviously, you still have to publish, and that's coming soon. It will be peer-reviewed and all of that. But you've made the announcement, the press conference, and you've been talking about it. It's got a lot of media interest.
We're in Houston, Texas at the Lanier Theological Library, where there's going to be a press conference about a major archaeological discovery from Israel, the oldest Hebrew text ever found in Israel. This is going to be one interesting press conference. Now we have in the land of Israel itself, dating to the late Bronze II period, 14th or 13th uh, century, you now have the divine name of God at a covenant site in Israel. And so this is of extreme importance. Now, like all digs, when they excavated and sifted their material, then they left large dump piles. With our new process, having gone back and checked old dump piles from the 1980s, we knew that they were full of scarabs, bula, and other glyptic material. And so it was not a shock to us that we did recover something of this, this importance. Now, the east dump is where they dumped their material from the altar. So we tracked, because we had some material, overall about 30% of the dump is what we were able to, to process. And some from the east dump, about 75% from the east dump, and about 25% from the west dump. And we tracked which came from which dump because we knew that the altar material had all gone into the uh, East Dump, according to Zephthal's notes. Bible prophecy is so incredible. I'd love for you to know more. When you get Armageddon's Dawn, the prophecy chart, this will really help you understand the panorama of end times prophecy. If your gift is $35 or more, let me also send you the entire Armageddon's Dawn video series and a book about the Antichrist, The Coming World Leader. Get this amazing prophecy chart for your gift of any amount. If your gift is $35 or more, we will also include the full eight-part video series. And if you act right now, we will also include The Coming World Leader. Call 800-78-GRACE right now or go to ingrace.tv to receive this limited time offer. And if you want to see what early Israelite writing, like pre-Paleo-Hebrew writing looks like, this is it. And this is the name of God, mm. the covenant name of God, Yahweh. So you have a Yod here, and then you have a He, so this man with his arms raised, and we have many parallels of this in other, other mm -hmm. texts. So you have a Yod, you have a He, and then you have a Vav. And together, this is Yahweh. And this is the first time we have this in Israel itself. And from this early time period, this is mind-boggling. The ramifications of this are going to reverberate for generations. Um, do you have a reliable biblical text? Was it written at an early period? So on many levels in academia, in scholarship, on a, on a popular faith level, uh, this, this will reverberate for a long time. So it's, it's another confirmation of the accuracy of the scriptures that I grew up believing and knowing, um, but it's, it's just that wonderful, wonderful reaffirmation maybe of that my faith isn't um, uh, silly or in vain. It's real, it's tangible. There are real right. evidences there. And this is, this is big. I mean, 3,400 years ago, someone wrote the name of Yahweh. And now here you are, millennia later, a believer and a follower of this God. And now you have the chance to see his name. On a scale of one to 10, this is a 10. Um, it doesn't get any bigger than this because of the ramifications. Uh, literacy in early Israel, was Moses able to write? Was Joshua able to write? These are questions that have been asked to, to minimize the, the Bible, the scriptures. Yeah, we've been beaten over the head. We conservative scholars have been beaten over the head from our, our liberal colleagues uh, that these are myths, that the Bible wasn't written until the Persian period or the Hellenistic period. And we're not supposed to take all this stuff too literally. Of course, we always knew that there was old, older writing, but now we have evidence of it at a site where the Bible says that they were reading and writing. And what they were reading and writing is very significant because this is how you make covenant in, in those times. It's made of lead. Yeah. Okay, so 
that can be tested to know where it came from. And I know you did that. Mm -hmm. So give us the detail on that. So we had a, a corner of the tablet that crumbled, and this is why we didn't open it. You know, it was fragile. So this corner that broke, we were able to have tested uh, for metallurgy, and the results were just what uh, what I'd hoped that they would be. It comes from Greece in a place called Lavrion, and we know that the mines were in use there during the Late Bronze II period. They went out of use and don't come back into use until the Iron Age too. so you've got a gap. We all know, we archaeologists, that around 1200, exports from Greece stopped. You're no longer getting imported material. You have the collapse of the Late Bronze Age civilization. So it is pretty significant that it comes from Lavrion and after 1200, exports have stopped. So again, that strongly suggests a pre-1200 date. You're going to publish. Uh, what What are the, the things that might come from the publication? Well, the publication will be out very soon. I just sent the final draft to my uh, colleagues yesterday to, uh, to do a final review before we submit it. So we're very close on that. Uh, the things that people will read about that maybe they haven't heard before and we can break the news now, uh, is that we have just as much writing on the outside as we have on the inside. And that will be the second part of the article. We're just publishing the first part, which is 50 pages. We didn't know we were gonna have that many letters. And so you have to write up each letter and the parallels and the documentation. And nobody wants to publish a 100 page article. So we're doing it in two parts, uh, the inside reading and the next will come the outside reading. And maybe the other interesting news is that I think we have the, the stylus, uh, or we'll, we have at least one stylus and possibly two or three. Can I say those were the ones that wrote it? Well, of course, I can't prove that, but we not only have the tablet, but we also have styluses. In the same WetSift project? Yes. So you found styluses? That's right. Okay, so I'm just gonna say it, it seems to me like it is a major archeological discovery, yeah. uh, just because there's so many levels of what this deals with. Do you feel privileged, blessed, maybe chosen of God to find this and to be able to speak on it and publish it? I feel humbled. Um, we're grateful to be able to do the work that we're doing, first of all, in the land of Israel, uh, that the Associates for Biblical Research is part of. This particular discovery seems providential, and I do feel very honored to have be able to, to lead this effort and to, to make this, this announcement. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And I remember you standing on Mount Ebal and you actually yelled out the curses and the blessings. And later on, we actually went down to ancient Shechem. Right. And we again talked about that. You know, it, it's almost like you're back in that time, back in that place. And this little lead tablet, it adds to the realness of that real event that happened. So what's that feeling like for you uh, to go to those places and to experience the things that had transpired thousands of years before? Yeah, Jim, we don't set out to prove the Bible. We're doing scientific archaeology, but we're doing it at biblical sites. And so inevitably, there's an interface between the two and questions of faith have to arise. So on a personal level, for me, it's tremendously meaningful to be able to deal with this, what I consider sacred material, a sacred responsibility to history uh, and to the God of history to accurately record uh, what we find. It's uh, meaningful to me, and I hope your, your viewers will find it meaningful as well. I'm just excited to be able to be uh, here today and to be able to talk to you about it. And congratulations. Thank you, Jim. That's awesome. I appreciate that and uh, grateful for your part in it. Thank you. While the Mount Ebal Curse Tablet discovery was exciting, so were some of the things that Scott's team had just uncovered here in Shiloh this season. A city gate? a tabernacle platform where the Ark of the Covenant once stood, a pile of kosher animal bones and ceremonial pottery, two gold stars. You don't want to miss part two next time. But let me take you back to the Lanier Library in Houston, Texas, the site of the cursed tablet announcement, and take a few moments in their beautiful chapel to contemplate what we've learned, to pray, and to talk about what all this means to us.
What an amazing discovery. The lead curse tablet, the inscription, early, early Hebrew, the earliest found in Israel, all of it verifying what the Bible has already told us. What does that mean for you and me? It's pretty simple. The Bible is true. God created us. We sinned. He sent His Redeemer, His Savior, His Son, Jesus, to die for our sins. A lot of people think they have to be religious. They have to do good works. They have to go to church. But Jesus said that all you have to do is believe in Him. What does that mean? What does believe mean? It means to trust in Him, to put your faith, your dependence in Him. Not, not religion, not a priest, not a pastor but in Jesus, the Son of God who died on a cross and rose again. That's the story of the Bible. And that's the story that I want to leave with you today. Simply trust in Him. And the Bible says you have right now everlasting life. My friends, that is good news. Bible prophecy is so incredible. I'd love for you to know more. When you get Armageddon's Dawn, the prophecy chart, this will really help you understand the panorama of end times prophecy. If your gift is $35 or more, let me also send you the entire Armageddon's Dawn video series and a book about the Antichrist, The Coming World Leader. Get this amazing prophecy chart for your gift of any amount. If your gift is $35 or more, we will also include the full eight-part video series. And if you act right now, we will also include the coming world leader. Call 800-78-GRACE right now or go to ingrace.tv to receive this limited time offer. Tune in next week for amazing discoveries from Israel. You can see the symmetrical opening in the wall that we've uncovered so you're coming through this gate arm area and now into the wall itself. Now we had enough that my theory was shaping up. Is this the platform of the tabernacle at Shiloh? Because it's an east-west monumental sized building. Record every single In Grace episode. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.